The electricity that reaches our homes first passes through the local distribution transformer. Its secondary output is about 433 volts in a three-phase, four-wire system. From this, households receive a 230-volt single-phase supply between any phase and neutral. In some countries, the domestic supply is 110 volts, but in India and most of Europe, it is 220 to 240 volts. This local transformer is supplied by an 11 kV feeder coming from a 33 by 11 kV substation, where the voltage is stepped down from 33 kV to 11 kV. We covered substations in a separate video. A substation is large and complex, but because this video focuses on transmission lines, we show it simply as a transformer. The 33 kV substation takes power from a 132 kV substation, then from 220 kV and 440 kV levels, and finally from the generating station that transmits at 765 kV. Generators typically produce about 11,000 volts. Step-up transformers raise this to 440 kV or 765 kV. Carrying 765 kV over long distances is challenging. Along the way, transmission lines face skin effect, corona loss, sag, and vibration. Let's unpack each one. A transmission line conductor is made up of many thin strands. At its center, you will notice some darker strands among the rest. These darker strands are steel reinforced and do not carry current. The surrounding strands are aluminum and they carry the current. Aluminum conducts well and offers low resistance, but its mechanical strength is weak. The distance between towers, known as the span, is usually 300 to 400 meters. Over this length, the conductors become heavy. So the steel core provides the aluminum strands with mechanical support. This design is called ACSR, Aluminum Conductor Steel Reinforced. You might wonder, why use many thin strands instead of a single strong conductor? The reason lies in alternating current at power frequency. In a thick conductor, AC tends to flow more on the outer surface than inside, a phenomenon known as the skin effect. In a 765 kV line, where conductors are very large, most of the current flows near the surface. In a 765 kV line, the conductor is about 3.5 centimeters thick, yet current penetrates only 0.66 millimeters inside. That means 99% of its area carries no current, a phenomenon called the skin effect. With most of the current at the surface, the conductor heats up and power loss occurs. To reduce this, the conductors are made of many small strands. This helps the current spread more evenly though the skin effect never disappears completely. Aluminum has another drawback. It expands a lot with heat. In summer, it stretches and sags between towers like a swing. This sag is inversely proportional to tension. More tension makes the wire tighter. In winter, natural tension develops on its own. Typically, a 300-meter span shows about 5 to 6 meters of sag. High above the ground, transmission lines face direct wind. As air flows past the conductor, it blocks the middle, leaving a hollow space. Here the air circulates into vortices that make the conductor vibrate. To control this, Stockbridge dampers are fixed near towers, shaped like dumbbells and heavy in weight. They absorb vibrations before they spread further. If you've noticed high voltage lines, each time they reach a tower, the line ends on a string of insulators. A jumper wire then connects it to the other side. This setup has important reasons. If a conductor breaks between towers, only that section needs replacement. But terminating the line at every tower brings its own problem. Cutting the conductor near insulators leaves sharp edges. These concentrate the electric field, making the conductor glow faintly. The glow is harmless, but wastes power. To prevent this, corona rings are fixed near insulators. They come in different shapes. A corona ring spreads the electric field evenly instead of letting it concentrate on sharp edges. In rain, water droplets make the conductor surface uneven, raising field intensity and causing corona discharge. Corona rings help control this. If you've walked near a high-voltage line, you may have heard its steady humming noise. 
Voltage itself, however high, makes no noise. Instead, it creates a voltage gradient around the conductor. Simply put, a high voltage conductor creates an electric field around itself. The closer you get, the stronger the field. At about 30 centimeters, it may reach 700 kV, ionizing the air. Further away, the voltage drops, though even at ground level, some effect remains. When ionized air discharges back, it crackles like sparking. This causes major losses in extra high voltage lines, called corona losses. Protecting lines from these is crucial. To reduce these losses, high voltage lines use bundle conductors. Here, each phase carries two or more conductors, which increases the effective radius. A large radius lowers the surface electric field, cutting corona losses and reducing the humming noise. Bundle conductors must be kept at equal spacing. Space dampers do this while also controlling vibration. If you're an electrical engineer, you may ask, since corona loss ionizes air and even sends voltage to ground, could this cause problems? The answer is yes, serious ones. In ultra-high voltage lines such as 765 kV, the conductors act like a battery's positive terminal and the ground acts as the negative. The space in between is the dielectric medium. The conductor and the ground act like the two plates of a capacitor, with the air in between as the dielectric. This capacitive effect, known as capacitive interference, stores energy in the line and raises the receiving end voltage above what was originally sent. Since the equipment at the receiving station is designed for 765 kV, this excess voltage can cause serious damage. In the substation video, you may remember a device that looked like a transformer, but had no output terminals. I had asked in the comments if you knew its name. That device is a shunt reactor, connected in parallel with the line. It has no output terminals. Its job is to control voltage when it rises too high because of capacitive interference. Here it's shown simply, but in practice the shunt reactor is placed inside the substation as seen in the last video. To put it simply, in the conductors, both voltage and current flow. With capacitive interference, the receiving end voltage rises. This means current moves ahead of voltage, called leading reactive power. You may ask, if current leads voltage, shouldn't the current be higher at the receiving station? But as we saw, it's the voltage that increases. The reason is simple. The capacitor supports the voltage, making it overshoot. A shunt reactor works opposite to a capacitor. It pulls the current back from leading, restoring balance. But in reality, transmission lines face even bigger challenges. Many of our household and industrial appliances, especially motor-driven ones such as fans, refrigerators, and air conditioners, consume reactive power. This makes the current lag behind the voltage, creating a shortage of reactive power in the system. To restore balance, a shunt capacitor is connected to the line, which supplies that required reactive power. In extra or ultra-high voltage substations, both shunt reactors and shunt capacitors may be present, but they're never connected at the same time. They're used as per reactive power needs. In smaller substations like 220 kV, capacitor banks are used instead. Here are a few useful facts. You can often tell a transmission line's voltage just by looking at it. Each tower carries a string of porcelain insulators to hold the conductors and stop current flowing into the tower. For 11 kV, there's one disc. For 33 kV, three discs. For 132 kV, about 12. Roughly one disc is used for every 11 kV. So by counting discs, you can estimate the line's voltage. Insulators themselves are a fine example of engineering. We'll explore them in detail in another video. You may also notice yellow or red balls on transmission lines. They serve no electrical role. They're placed near airports to help aeroplanes spot the high voltage lines. I hope this video has given you a clear understanding of transmission lines. If you have any doubts, share them in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. In the last video, we discussed how substations handle high voltage power. Make sure to watch that one too.